What's up, everybody? It's Chris from The Rewired Soul, where we talk about the problem, but focus on the solution. And I am joined once again by the wonderful Dr. Mark Golston. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm doing good, Chris. And uh, thank you so much for supporting all the efforts that I'm making to, uh, to lessen suicide. And, uh, and to all you listeners, uh, I, I know Chris can be controversial. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I will tell you, he has a certified heart of gold, mm. but there's many layers over it. So you have to get to know him to see it and feel it. <laughs> you got to get, <laughs> get down through the layers. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and something that um, I'm trying to assist with is getting the word out there about the Stay Alive video that you did with... Uh, Kevin, Kevin Hines and uh, the artist Rayco. Uh, Rayco. Um, yeah. Can you explain to the audience a little bit about, I've seen it, but can you explain to them a little bit about what that video is? It'll be linked down in the description as usual, but can you kind of let them know what the purpose of that video is? Okay, so Stay Alive is a, it, it's a conversation uh, that I moderated uh, and the two main participants besides me were Kevin Hines and he's the this force of nature who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and survived. He's an amazing human being. And Reiko is a Japanese pop singer, you know, and she's had depression in her life, and, but she's also an advocate for suicide prevention. Uh, she, her group uh, performs at animation conferences and gaming conferences. So mm -hmm. we're hoping to bring our stay alive and what we've learned out to those, out to those people because there's a real dark side to the gaming community, mm -hmm. the community, and that sort of thing. And so, uh, you know, and, and it's done rather well. And, and you can actually find it if you go to YouTube and mm -hmm. and you put, uh, and you search for "Stay Alive" video. And the channel uh, the channel breaks the documentary up into eight chapters. Uh, you can there's also a link to see the whole thing, mm -hmm. not stop. But the eight chapters will will help you focus more on what each of them is about and so we're spreading the word i'm doing a couple maybe three interviews a day on yeah. this and and how we how we feel it's different is you know there's more suicide awareness now maybe than ever before but the rate of suicide is climbing quickly yeah and that and that's exactly why i wanted to talk to you about billy eilish and this topic so so my my guess my guess just kind of knowing you mark is that you're not listening to billy eilish teenage pop music no no okay so let me let me fill you in because it's something i'm learning about i've done quite a few videos i've had a lot of people recommend uh her to me just because she has lyrics about mental health and sadness and depression and all these other things i just kind of want to lay out the 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 framework of this and then have a discussion with you about it so billy eilish she kind of broke out as an artist when she was about 15 she's now 17 and she just released her new album and something that people wanted me to talk about was is she kind of glamorizing depression or some people are labeling, labeling it as misery music? And something that I know when I was growing up and I was a teenager, I listened to a lot of very dark, sad, depressing music with some very dark messages in it. So I could relate to that. And for me, it helped me know that somebody else out there understood the pain I was feeling. And sometimes what I found with music is somebody can put into words what I'm feeling better than I can. Um, but kind of like what you just mentioned is the suicide rates are still huge. I was just looking at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and like the there was like 1.4 million attempts in 2017. Like that's a lot of attempts. And so with Billie Eilish, her demographic is mainly teenagers, some people in their early 20s. I'm not the demographic, you're not the demographic. So I want to kind of have this conversation with you about, you know, teens who are feeling this way, because if you look in the comments of her videos, like her music videos, you see a lot of young people saying they can relate. And, you know, sometimes they say like, this music is the only thing that's keeping them around. And, you know, so I don't know. Like one of the questions I guess I have is I'm a parent, if my son was really listening to a lot of this music, should I be concerned? Should I have a conversation? Like, what What are your thoughts on this? I think the music is helpful. Anything that helps people feel less alone helps them. You know, along the same lines, and something I have mixed feelings about, I, I have 560,000 Twitter followers. 
And I have permanently pinned at, at Mark Goulston, if you go there, at M-A-R-K-G-O-U-L-S-T-O-N, I have permanently pinned at the top a, a question. How many of you have known of or known someone in your community who committed suicide? I know you're not supposed to say committed suicide, and, but it's too late. And it has 2.4 million impressions, a lot of impressions, mm -hmm. uh, over 1,400 comments, and two thirds of the comments are people just listing all the people they know who've killed themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's chilling. Uh, and a number of people will say, I've tried several times. And a number of people have said, I've tried several times. And I'll probably eventually do it. Now, it's a community. Uh, you know, it's just me putting it up there. And what I do is I invite people to share with each other compassion, you know. Uh, uh, in fact, I remember someone reached out to me and said they were feeling worthless. And I said, if you're feeling worthless, go track the comments. And if there's someone who's having a hard time and I can't stay on top of them, again, it's not a clinic, it's a community. You know, we have references to national suicide lifeline numbers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They said, reach out and, and check and just check with someone like haven't, haven't heard your comments lately, just checking to see if you're okay. And a number of those people are going to say, Thank you for reaching out. Mm -hmm. And you may, have, you may actually save some lives. And what's going to happen is you're going to feel worthwhile. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Now, I worry about it because, uh, again, uh, I'm not meaning to be irresponsible, but I, I just don't have the manpower to stay on top of it. So I've just I, I've left it there and I will occasionally respond and comment. But, you know, there's, there's only so much time in the day. Yeah, if you're worried about your, your kid being in a, in, a, in a tough place, and a lot of times adolescents, they don't want to talk. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the reasons they don't want to talk is many times they're afraid that if they talk, they're going to start to cry. Mm. And what they don't know, and even this is true with adults. I mean, when I was in, a clin in my clinical practice, I wouldn't make anyone cry. I'd enable them to cry. Mm. And, they had, and they had so much crying inside. To me, it was like looking at a big abscess with all this pus that needed to drain. Mm -hmm. But just like if you have an abscess, you, you, know, you don't want the surgeon to go in there with the scalpel and whatever, even though you know it needs to drain. And, mm -hmm. and, and so human beings are like that. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's good, even though initially, you know, the knee-jerk reaction of parents who don't have these kind of close conversations with anyone uh, will, will say, oh, it'll be okay. But what you have to realize is it's good for them to cry. Mm -hmm. They're crying with the relief of not feeling so alone. That, that can then lead to what to do about it. But I wouldn't race in with what to do about it. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I get the feeling for them to kind of even get it out of their system. Yeah. And other questions you can say, here's a good question. So they're crying about it. What you, what you then say is, look at me, look at me. I understand anyone would have felt that way. And it's going to get better. Um, next time that happens, what would be a better thing to do when you're feeling that bad? What you're hoping they'll start to realize is talking to you. <laughs> yeah. Talking to someone. Yeah. And so getting circling back is because people don't have this. Mm -hmm. They, when they, when they, resonate with music that they can relate to because what, what you said at the beginning of my long you know monologue there is people are writing comments to these the song and they say oh i can really relate to it mm -hmm. just like they can say it on that tweet at my uh, twitter page and i can relate to it i can connect to it mm -hmm. and that's what people yeah you see what happens is people who feel really depressed and suicidal they can't connect to anything. And so when it gets really awful, they connect to death to just take the pain away. So, so there's, there's this real deep need to connect with other people. But what's happened is we don't have the vocabulary for it. Yeah. Uh, I love music because music, there's something, it's not just the lyrics we're relating to. You know, the lyrics are weaved into the melody and the melody can draw you in. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, something I didn't realize until the last 10, 15 years, some of my favorite songs, you know, from an older era, I sort of remember the lyrics, but a lot of times it was the music. 
and I was drawn into the melody mm -hmm. and, and, and some of my favorite songs, I only really read the lyrics in the last 20 years and I thought, oh my God, those were amazing lyrics. <laughs> I, I wasn't hearing the words, I was hearing the melody because the melody would draw me. Yeah, and that's that's something that that's one of the reasons why I really like um, breaking down lyrics too. Is like I know when I when I first started working on my own mental health and trying to pull myself up out of that hole was just like learning how to communicate these things, even if it was just with myself, right? Like this is what you're feeling. This is how it feels. And I, I don't know. I might just be you know. There's a theory of mine that people enjoy me breaking down some of those lyrics because it helps dive even deeper. Or maybe it's just some confirmation that the way they interpreted these lyrics, maybe somebody else interpreted them, them as well. But I know you and I have talked about, you know, you wrote a piece on Anthony Bourdain after he passed away. And here's a conversation that keeps coming up. Billie Eilish being a young woman of 17 years old, making these very dark lyrics. And she's, she has said that, she kind of does this as like, a, uh, she like thinks of different characters. That's how she writes her music. But you know, there's interviews where it seems a little bit differently. But here, here's the thing. Um, I don't know if you remember um, Chester Bennington. He, he was a musician who took his own life a couple years ago. Um, recently was the anniversary of Kurt Cobain. And I know as listeners, as the audience, there's not much we can do. We don't know these people, but I don't know. There's an there's there's a conversation out there like, oh, you know, this doesn't involve you. This isn't your concern, which I kind of disagree with because we do lose people all the time. So it's like, what can we do? What conversations can we have? How do we know if somebody is struggling? Because like I like I just made a video talking about Chester Bennington that came out of nowhere um, for me. And when you look at his interviews and stuff before he passed away, he was very happy and outgoing and, and everything like that. <clears throat> but the conversation I was trying to have with people is, I know that when I was at my lowest in my depression, I could easily put on a mask and make everybody believe that I was okay. What are, do you have any thoughts or suggestions on that for if somebody has somebody in their life, like are there, are there subtle signs to look for if somebody appears okay, but clearly something else is going on. Maybe, maybe a parent finds their kid's journal, right? And they're writing down these dark thoughts or whatever it is, but on the outside, you know, they're playing sports and they're doing well in school and they have friends. Do you have any, any suggestions about that? Because that's something I worry about because I know I used to wear that mask all the time that I was okay. Well, there's something that I suggest the parents and you can, you know, I've already gone over the seven words, but I often suggest the parents, especially teenagers who aren't old enough to drive yet, the best time to have conversations is when you're driving somewhere because it's not eye to eye, heart to heart. Teenagers do not like these eye to eye, heart to heart conversations. It really creeps them out unless they're seeking you out. And so when you're doing a parallel activity and the perfect one is you're driving and they're there, uh, that, that's the best time uh, to actually have a conversation with them now of course you know in this day and age they're looking at their iphone and, mm -hmm. and and even while you're driving you're looking at your text messages and saying the hell if i get pulled over by a cop so so even in the car it's tough to do that but i often suggest the parents to to be curious about your kids minds and and you might say something like uh, i'm curious about something um and you ask one of your kids um which of, your, which of the kids in your class do you think is going to get in trouble this year? And, and, and we're not going to blow the whistle on them. I'm not going to call the parents. But, you know, which kid do you think will get in trouble? Well, so-and-so. Why? Well, you know, they got kicked out three times last year. Okay. Uh, do they seem better now? Well, I don't know. Uh, and again, you're, you're not giving them advice. You're pulling things out of them. And or you might even say, uh, uh, any idea why they get in trouble? Any, any thoughts about what happened to them? That mm -hmm. they keep? So it's a way of drawing out of them, you know, insight, judgment, perspective. But where you really want to take it uh, is you want to get them to talk about stuff. Mm -hmm. so, so another question you might ask them, which is school related, is you could say, you know, you know, I'm really, I'm really, I'm really liking finding out how you think. Let me ask you in school, what's a class you can 
you don't have to study for until the last minute. You can get away with it. Mm-hmm. And, what, and what's one that you better stay on top of? And again, you don't tell them what to do, but you're planting seeds in them. Well, I better stay on top of, uh, you know, a math because you miss a couple of days, you may get caught up. But if I have to write a term paper, you know, I could probably bullshit the last minute. And throw some- <laughs> well, well, that really makes sense. But you're having them come up with their solutions. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then, you know, where you really want to take it, and I'm not saying you should have this all in one conversation, but you can plant the seed and on a future drive, you can say, remember how I asked you all those kind of, you know, crazy questions that I was curious about? Yeah, yeah. Okay. What dad? What mom? Well, it's back again. I got a couple more. And you say it sort of in a humorous way. How do you know the difference between for yourself, a bad mood you're having that it's just going to pass, you know, mm-hmm. and, you're, and you're angry or you want to, you know, never speak to one of your friends. You just know, you know, it's sort of temporary and something that doesn't seem temporary. And so you're wanting them to tell you the difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you know the difference between something you should come and talk to me or your mom or your dad about and something you should try and figure out on your own? Mm hmm. So do you follow what I'm saying? It's a it's a different frame of yeah. inquiry. Yeah, something something that I've even done with my ten year old son because I like um, I'm a I'm a fan of I'm not no, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Dr. Daniel Siegel. Um, he does a lot of like uh, neuroscience and childhood brain yeah, development, yeah, yeah, mindfulness. Yeah, yeah, mindfulness. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> love his stuff. And and he talks a lot about I forgot which book it was. I think it was like the Yes. The yes mm-hmm. brain or something, but it, a lot of it is like uh, having your children like put stories together to kind of connect the dots. And so, like when I watch a movie with my son, like I'm like, which what parts did you like about this movie? What what do you think that character was feeling or thinking? And I think it's helped him develop empathy. But even still, like something I'll ask him, you know, I'm a 33 year old man, he's 10 years old, but we'll be driving and I'll tell him about an issue that I'm going through and I'll ask him for suggestions. Be like, well, what would you do in this situation, right? If you were dealing with these types of comments from people on your YouTube videos, or if you were dealing with this with your friends, like, what do you think I should do? And something I'm just trying to get his his problem solving wheels turning Absolutely. to kind of uh, look at look at those situations. And and um, I, it's something I've really been practicing with him the last couple months. And um, I've noticed that he's come to me more often. Um, maybe he'll just overhear me having a conversation and just kind of toss in some suggestions and, and things like that. But I've also had him come to me and tell me about his own situations. He plays a ton of Fortnite with his friends online and he'll tell me about those situations. Like dad, I got really upset and I just told my friends I had to walk away for a little bit and things like that. So, so yeah, I'm not like, I'm not sure if it's working. It's just something that I'm, I'm trying to do because my number one thing that I'm trying to do with my son, like my number one goal is that he always knows he could talk to me, you know, because even in the Twitter chat today, like we were talking a lot about teens and youth and and I just know there's so much fear around talking to parents. I know when I first started developing a lot of my depression and anxiety in high school, I was afraid to talk to a teacher, a counselor, my parents. I was afraid that they were gonna send me and like lock me up in a straitjacket just because I didn't know any better. I and like, if, if anybody knew what was going on in my mind, I thought they were gonna lock me up. So I just kept it inside. You know, so that's that's why I love having these conversations about just figuring out different ways to discuss well, things. Well, it's interesting you say that because because I think you're absolutely right that a lot of teenagers are afraid to have these conversations. Uh, I think there's several layers. Uh, superficially, what they're afraid of is you know I'm going to get punished, or I'm going to you know they're going to look at me like I'm weird or I'm sick. Another thing they're afraid of, but not as conscious of it is that is that it's going to be a sort of i wouldn't say belittle but just sort of disregard oh that's no big deal and then what that's going to trigger in you is i knew i shouldn't have told them what it's going to trigger in you is hurt resentment and if they do that a lot you start to get enraged at them Mm. you know and so there's a fear that either uh, they'll punish me or they'll just you know uh, uh minimize it or uh, they won't they won't be able to do anything and then I'll really feel alone and helpless because maybe I'm saving talking to them when I really need them. And then when I talk to them and I really need them, 
and and they come up clueless, that's just going to make me feel even more alone. Mm -hmm. A lot of these things are functioning in, in teens' minds. I think what you're doing is 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 actually brilliant because you're not laying your problems on him. You're respecting his mind and say, what would you do in these situations? I also love the idea of if you ever watch anything, a movie or you watch American Idol or The Voice or any of these things, I think asking your kids questions, you know, who do you think the most nervous contestant was? Mm. You know, who's the one do you think that had the most sad story that the judges, you know, you know, wanted to push through, but mm -hmm. they just weren't talented enough. And geez, what do you think that kid felt? So I think using those shared experiences and causing them to sort of drill down, because see what you really want your kids and you and and our listeners to really be able to do is pause and ask themselves, what happened to me that caused me to want to do this? I feel like hurting myself or hurting someone else. You want people to stop and, and say to themselves, what happened to me that caused me to do that? Yeah, that's... You know, and then, and, then mm -hmm. and, and with some luck, and, and when they pause, uh, that can help them back off that irresistible impulse that could be really destructive. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's, well, the overall topic I'm about to mention is a whole nother video, but that's kind of what I'm trying to do when I bring in pop culture things for my YouTube videos with the audience is trying to get inside the mind of this person because I just, I believe the more that we think about that and kind of give attention, like conscious attention to someone else's feelings and emotions and potential thought processes, it makes us be more mindful of our own. You know what I mean? Because I just think too many, too many of us watch things very passively. Like you mentioned just American Idol or, you know, other TV shows or movies or whatever. We watch them just kind of zone out. And I, I'm a huge believer in turning everything into a, some type of learning experience. So what I'm suggesting to you with your followers is what you could say to them is, you may or may not have uh, checked it out, but one of one of the celebrities said this thing. And clearly, you know, and they got a lot of backlash. And so it was probably a slip of the tongue, but I'm assigning you, my followers, let's get a deeper understanding of, of anyone who makes one of these comments that grabs our attention. Mm. And it's fair game because, you know, because they're in the public eye and because making these comments and being a celebrity is what allows them to be popular, make a lot of money. So whatever they say or do is fair game. But, but rather than just reacting to the behavior, uh, because this is, a, this is the rewired uh, soul, uh, mm -hmm. let's go deeper. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to try that and see. And, and again, I can't promise anything because if, if, if I get feedback saying, you know, this is boring, Chris. Can you do some more stuff so that we can hate you? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I absolutely love that idea because... I, I feel like just we, like right now, we live in a very reactionary time. And a lot of people are just like, I, I think it's just because we're so inundated with information constantly. Every day there's somebody else getting, you know, backlash and everything like that. And people, I don't think we take enough time to sit back and mm -hmm. pause and say, what, what, what do I think the motivation was? What do I think the intention was, you know, or, or the background and what are some contributing factors that might've led to this, mm -hmm. right? And that's something I try to look at with every situation that happens in the news or when you were talking too, I was looking at my own situation and I was like, okay, what were things that contributed to all these things? And as individuals, the most we could do is take it and learn from it, but Something I've always been trying to teach my audience too is that I learn from other people's successes as well as their mistakes. Like that's what I love about mentorship too is that you have somebody kind of guiding you on a certain path and saying, here's what worked for me, here's what didn't work for me, you know? 
So we're not just kind of like winging it throughout life. Like we we find somebody who's actually gained some wisdom. And yeah, but we're running. I'm running short for today, but we'll continue yeah. the conversation. Always, like, always, always a pleasure, Mark. And everybody else watching, there will be links down below. So thanks again so much for your time, Mark. And we'll do this again soon. We're going to continue it. I, you're not getting rid of me that easily. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Mark.